and we are live. Good afternoon, everybody. Session number 10, the penultimate session of RMUS Tech Week 2023, the third annual. Uh, it's been a heck of a week and uh, we are we're still going here. And so we have our final panel. Uh, this is our, our third session of the day. We uh, we we started the day out with a uh, with a tremendous if I if I sound like the Donald there a tremendous tremendous session uh, on first uh, first responder multimodal ro ro robotics that was really exciting. Uh, Fraser just uh, brought us with some advanced industrial uh, inspections uh, with uh, some fantastic new robots from Sky Gauge and uh, Housebots as well as uh, some sensors from Ophil. So a lot of uh, really, really cutting edge new technology. So we wanted to bring it down to the tip of the spear for this afternoon. And we talked all week about autonomy and AI and advanced autonomy and all kinds of good stuff like that. And it's all kind of leading into this session because this session, we're going to talk about a case study from uh, one of our one of our most innovative partners, uh, Ontario Power Generation. We've been working with OBG in, in multi-modes of robotics for, for years now, uh, and we're really, really excited to be continuing that partnership. But OBG is really on the cutting edge of applying the, the SPOT, the Boston Dynamics SPOT technology we had Matt on earlier in the afternoon, um, and partnered with, with one of our key uh, new partners, Levitas, on the AI and advanced autonomy side. So really, we're going to talk to you a little bit about uh, a real-world proof of concept that's going on right now as we speak on the ground, in the flesh. This is not vaporware. This is the this is the real deal. Uh, and we're excited to let you hear about it uh, and you'll be able to understand uh, what's going on, what goes into this, what's happening, what's the next thing. All, all the things, if you're thinking about deploying this technology, now that you know it actually happens in a few places, um, you'll be ready to rumble. And so we have, uh, we have an excellent uh, and exciting panel here today to talk about that. Um, so, Jonathan, if you can uh, if you can flip up that slide session, and we will introduce our most uh, august panelists. All right, so we've got it on here. Give us a uh, give us the next thing. We get everybody's we get everybody's Photoshop pictures. So this is where you compare how do people look in real life to their pictures, right? So I think we've got I think we're pretty good. Scott's beard looks a little bit more trim, but everybody else is uh, is looking very similar. So that's excellent. So first off. It is my, my pleasure to announce and introduce from uh, Ontario Power Generation, uh, Ali Kaflagi, who is uh, one of the key people in the project at OPG. So Ali, can you um, please introduce yourself and a little bit about uh, OPG and what you're doing there, please? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'll get into a bit about OPG. Um, Bit later on after everyone's done their introductions. But uh, hey, everyone, my name is Ali Kafegi. Um, I'm here to represent Ontario Power Generation, or OPG for short. Um, just a little background on myself. I'm currently an assistant technical engineer slash officer within um, OPG's Monitoring and Diagnostic Center, M&D Center, uh, which falls under our Data Analytics and Innovation Department. Um, just a bit of uh, of my education history. Um, I studied chemical engineering while also completing a chemical process modeling optimization and control specialization and a management sciences option uh, and graduated uh, with a Bachelor of Applied Science from the University of Waterloo back in 2021. And so uh, I've always had an interest in you know robotics and artificial intelligence and so I'm, I'm honored to be speaking here today. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Our, uh, our next speaker is, uh, is also a, a, a bright and exciting uh, gentleman from Ontario Tech University, who is our partner along with uh, OPG or for OPG in this scenario, um, and is, is leading the project on the uh, Ontario Tech side. Uh, Chris Baird. Chris, please introduce yourself and your role. Yeah, hi. So my name is Chris Baird. I'm a PhD candidate at uh, Ontario Tech University. So I'm in the Mechatronic and Robotic Systems Lab that's headed by uh, Dr. Scott Nockley, who talked in a second. Um, our essentially part in this project is where we're helping take the uh, work that Levitas has done and actually implement it with Spot in, in OPG's use case. So I, I think uh, Dr. Nockley can talk about it a bit more. 
All right. Thank you, Chris. So we have uh, our next guest is the is the eminent uh, Dr. Scott Knockleby is announced, and Scott is the a, a professor. He's an assistant assistant or associate dean. Sorry, Scott, if I'm it's one of those two, and uh, head of the uh, the world renowned uh, Mars Lab in Ontario Tech. So, Scott, please uh, welcome and please introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, yeah, so my name is uh, Scott Knockleby. I'm the associate dean and a professor in the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science here at Ontario Tech University, uh, located in Oshawa. I'm also the director of the Mechatronic and Robotic Systems Lab, where Chris is my one of my students, uh, one of my PhD students. And we've been on an ongoing project with Ontario Power Generation, looking at uh, applications of SPOT uh, since basically summer of 21 now. Um, so we've been working on a variety of projects, and one of the most recent ones is the one we're going to talk about today. Uh, which is leveraging AI and Levitas's platform for autonomous inspections. Fantastic, and and I will will commend both Scott and uh, Chris. They have uh, they have really really pushed the envelope uh, on what is possible with the Boston Dynamics platform. Uh, and I know Boston Dynamics has been super impressed, and and as a result, OPG is sort of a global leader right now in terms of applying uh, spot technologies in the field. So it's really exciting. Um, and speaking of global leaders, uh, really, I think more so than any other uh, company in the application side, Levitas is really pushing the envelope and what can be done with Spot in terms of both um, advanced autonomy and navigation, which we'll talk about, as well as introducing AI and change detection models. Uh, and in addition to that, he has a he has a French seeming name. So I would like to introduce if if in Canada he's Jean Samaru. But uh, everywhere else, he is Gene Samaru. So, uh, Gene, I will pass it over to you to introduce yourself. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah, so Gene Samarau, I'm a part of Levitas. We work in automating industrial inspections. As Kevin mentioned, we've been doing this for uh, several years now um, and very excited, in essence, to be a part of this project with people like OPG and Ontario Tech because... As Kevin alluded to, they are some of the most advanced users of Spot and the most ready to kind of take our platform and start running with it. So I'm very excited to be part of this panel and also just for the partnership in general, because I know with how high level they are in terms of their application and understanding of the platform, that it really is a partnership that will I will see continue to grow over time and you know, kind of expanding from there. So very excited kind of with this first proof of concept to see where things go with uh, as a partnership. Excellent. Excellent. Well, listen, I want to thank you uh, all for, for joining and I'm excited to uh, get into this and share. So what we'll do today is um, we, uh, we've got a few slides. We felt that was actually the easiest way to do it. So um, we will start with, um, with Ali. We'll lead the, uh, he will lead, just give you a kind of background on OPG and what the project sort of set everything up. And then we'll move into talking about specifics and what we've learned so far and what, we, uh, what we're going to be learning. And that'll be covered by um, Ali, uh, Gene, and uh, and Scott, and Chris. So we'll we'll get everybody uh, nice and involved. So, uh, Jonathan, if you want to uh, flip the slide there, and I will pass it over to you, Ali. Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. All good. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Kevin. So as I mentioned, yeah, I'll uh, start off with some kind of background on on Ontario Power Generation. So uh, we're a utility that produces, I believe, about half of Ontario's uh, power. And, and just to be safe, there might be people who here who aren't, you know, completely familiar with Canada's geography. But um, so Ontario is Canada's most populated province um, out of the 10 provinces and 30 territories that we have. So um, we have a population of around 15 million, I believe. Uh, so that, that accounts for a little less than 40% of, of um, Canada's entire population. So just in summary, uh, a lot of people rely on our power. So um, OPG deals with, we deal with the generation and, and not the transmission side of it. Uh, and we have a very diverse fleet. So um, just in summary, uh, we, have, we have two nuclear stations. Um, we have one biomass station, uh, one solar facility, uh, one dual fueled uh, oil and gas, um, and 66 hydroelectric stations. 
Uh, we also have four combined cycle um, gas turbine stations through one of our subsidiaries, a tour power. And uh, even in the United States through another subsidiary, uh, Eagle Creek Renewable Energy, uh, we have 85 hydro sites there. So um, pretty diverse fleet uh, that's uh, you know allocated um, uh, all across. So today uh, we're mainly focused on the Ontario um, hydro fleet. So uh, at OPG, uh, we currently have five spot dogs that we're using slash testing, I'll say, uh, for different applications. Uh, so in the nuclear and hydroelectric space. So specifically for hydro, um, you know, we've been collaborating with Ontario Tech University and Levitas, um, and we're essentially interested in assessing, you know, the viability and the value of deploying spot dogs at, at our um, outlying sites. So as evident by that image there on the right. Uh, we have many sites that are dispersed across um, the province. And you know, while these um, sites are remotely operated, uh, employees still have to travel very long distances for inspection, maintenance, and asset reliability purposes. Uh, so, you know, eliminating or uh, reducing that, um, you know, w would be ideal. So, for example, uh, if there's a leak of some sort that requires to be inspected visually first before any action is taken, you know, rather than having someone have to travel to one of those remote sites, uh, a potential application could be to use Spot to kind of operate from afar and be used to and kind of, you know, I'll say quote unquote, scope out the situation and just kind of get value of the station conditions to, um, you know, enable ample planning before any potential maintenance work is needed. So. Um, you know, even another example really is, so these stations have monthly inspections that are uh, required to be completed. And, and some of the tasks that need to be performed can be done visually. So for example, you know, um, visually checking, uh, you know, exit sign lightings or um, just ensuring that fire extinguishers are there, you know, recording values from, from, from gauges. So temperatures, voltages, you know, in, indicators really. Um, so, so visually kind of um, ch checking things out. And so while for now, at least, uh, it may not be feasible or, or possible to automate all the required inspection tasks, we can at least minimize them, you know, to, to um, ensure that a maintainer's focus is on the functional tasks, uh, such as, you know, if they would need to collect like transformer oil samples to analyze like oil degrees, concentration levels, things like that. So, you know, even and and even for non-standard predictive maintenance purposes, um, I think there is great potential with this technology. So, for example, uh, you know, assessing a, a transformer's health on a regular basis could potentially be performed, you know, using uh, thermal imaging capabilities of Spot. So, um, you know, things like that I think uh, uh, can be possible, and there's a lot of value added with with those things. So. Uh, we're currently undergoing a field trial right now at our Sydney Jettering Station, uh, which is a bit more than, I'll, I'll say, about two and a half hours from downtown Toronto. So on the map there, uh, it's just um, northeast of, of Toronto. So for, for this pilot, uh, we have spot programmed to complete two separate auto walk missions, one on the main floor and one going down the stairs into the unit pits. Uh, and each of those runs three times a day. Um, and some of the things we're testing out uh, are change detection and people deten detection functionalities of the Levitas platform, uh, as well as uh, you know thermal gauge readings, uh, valve positions, uh, and, and leak detection. So um, in this trial, we're also using something known as PagerDuty, which is essentially an incident re uh, response platform. Uh, and basically what it does is it'll send a notification if there is an issue with spot um, complaining the auto walk. So uh, just in summary, I'll say our goals and ultimately the long-term potential of this would be, um, you know, to get a sense of station and unit conditions without having to physically be present um, at these remote sites to, to make better use of resources, which in turn could, you know, of course, improve asset reliability and allow for, for maintenance decisions to be made quicker um, or, or, or beforehand. So, you know, for example, ensuring that all the required tools and the setup, uh, operating setup or, and the equipment, uh, all that's available before any travel is done. So, um, 
and you know, I think another aspect of this is also to eliminate or at least minimize the required number um, and length of trips that employees would have to make to these remote sites. Um, I think there's a lot, um, a lot of value with that. So that's kind of the lead into our conversation and the use case, really. So uh, with that, I can uh, turn it over to the Ontario Tech University folks. Thank you. Excellent. So Jonathan, if you could uh, pass the slide along. Um, okay, great. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Scott. <clears throat> sure. So um, like I said earlier, this is uh, my lab is the Mechatronic and Robotic Systems Laboratory at Ontario Tech University. So just for those who aren't familiar, Ontario Tech is uh, located in North Oshawa and Oshawa being um, about an hour east of Toronto there. So you can see the red little dot. That's where the, the university is located. So my lab is involved in research in autonomous systems, including robots, uh, both ground-based and uh, aerial or, or drones, as people like to say. And as I mentioned, uh, since about 21, summer of 21, we started this project with Ontario Power Generation to look at uh, investigating the capabilities of SPOT um, for autonomous inspection and other tasks as well. We've also looked at doing it for first response. So things like Firewatch, um, you can go on our YouTube channel there. You can see videos of SPOT actually autonomously detecting fires and putting them out with a fire extinguisher. Um, we've also, we're one of the first to have SPOT autonomously ride elevators from one floor to the other. Um, this has all been work uh, led by my PhD student, Chris Baird. So he's the, uh, the wizard behind a, a lot of the work you're going to see. So with that, I will turn it over to the next slide. All right, so let's let's pass it along to uh, to Gene. So we'll talk a little bit about Levitas and some of the exciting stuff we're doing, and then we'll get right into the specific project and some discussions there. So Gene, away over to you, my friend. Perfect. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat> so yeah, as mentioned, uh, Levitas is a company that I work for. What we specialize in is automating end-to-end -end solutions. Um, as you can see from that uh, photo in the middle, that does not mean that we're limited just to spot our pro our project or our product is chassis agnostic so it could be put on drones fixed cameras any type of robotics not limited to spot uh, we've also seen it kind of run through some servers just kind of as an endpoint and processing images from there um, could you go to the next slide john so how does it work um kind of jumping into it the kind of the main value add that ollie really hit the nail on the head for was you automate routine inspection the big big points of that is you increase the safety. People don't need to drive out to, you know, uh, remote sites and in inclement weather anymore. You can have remote viewing available so you can kind of prevent the need for that, increase the amount of safety that each uh, potential contractor has going out there, but then also you increase the accuracy and the frequency of those checks as well. Fortunately, a robot doesn't get bored. Uh, so kind of the short term benefit of that when we say that is you already have an increase in safety. Um, it's more reliable and predictable when these checks are happening. As we know, oftentimes thermal checks or some of the more complex inspections can only occur a couple times a year, sometimes once or twice. Um, so what this does on the short term, as Ali was alluding to is we're able to assign thresholds to this uh, these checks, whether it's an analog gauge that is reading too high, a temperature that's running a little too low or too high, or uh, you know anything you could really think of as far as these these models. And what we're able to do from there, once that threshold is passed, is provide a, a notification either via email or text message. And kind of the value add of that is decreasing the the haystack, if you will. That's kind of how we like to describe it Describe it as instead of trying to find the needle in the haystack, we shrink the size of the haystack. So instead of needing to perform hundreds of inspections, we're only presenting you the ones that require your attention, only the ones that are a little too hot or too high. Now, in terms of the long-term benefits beyond that, all this data is going to be stored over time. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the those checks oftentimes only happen a couple of times a year. So there's a lot of insights that are able to be discovered as you're collecting this data on such a more frequent basis, as opposed to once a year, you're talking once an hour. 
So when you kind of have that information available to you and, you know, kind of our preconceived notion may be, well, at 200 degrees Celsius, we've got a problem and we need to prevent, say, an unplanned outage uh, that could affect some customers in our service area. Instead, what we may learn about a substation on the north side of Ontario is that it functions totally different from one on the south side due to weather conditions, et cetera. And we can start to glean insights from all of those extra data points that we get instead of being so few and far between to the point where instead of knowing that 200, 200 degrees Celsius is a problem, maybe we start to learn that if it starts riding 180 for a week straight, then we know that this has happened three times before and we can go out and know that we need to perform this kind of maintenance before there's an issue. And really the goal here to translate very specifically to uh, you know, a customer like Ontario Power is reducing unplanned outages, knowing more about your equipment and making sure that the customers in your service area receive service for longer and less interruptions, right? So in essence, kind of getting to a place where instead of we're doing reactive maintenance to a place where we're doing it proactive and even predictive and prescriptive from there. Uh, the last point kind of on the slide is the ability to integrate spot and whatever other robotics or communication systems together. Uh, what I mean by that is some uh, power generation folks or oil and gas folks need to deal with um, potentially explosive gases uh, that certain robots can't function in. So what we're able to do is beyond those kinds of gas monitors, say maybe fire alarm systems, or even audible alarms, we can have Spot communicate with that and take actions from there. A quick example of that will be if we start achieving higher LEL levels where there's a potential for explosion, we can tell Spot to get out of there or shut off and cut, uh, cut power to the motors. Uh, could you give me the next slide, please? Thank you, sir. All right, so kind of the customer business cases that we look at, the way that we kind of start to uh, funnel this down is, as I mentioned, the automation of current inspection tasks. That's kind of the big benefit here. We're able to take over these tasks that are currently being performed by humans and increase the frequency of it. More repeatable and reliable data collection. Also with Spot, you're able to outfit him with separate different sensors. Really the benefit of Spot, as I'm sure you've likely heard throughout this week, is that it is a mobile sensor rather than needing to equip your site with um, you know, separate cameras, uh, thermal uh, cameras, or even acoustic sensors, you can buy just one, put it on spot and make him walk around. As opposed to, you know, in some cases, especially in the nuclear and power generation space, we've heard numbers like a foot of electrical wire costs us $5,000, $10,000. So that sort of stuff gets expensive pretty quickly. Um, and when you have those sensors available on one mobile unit, you're able to equip it with some more things, such as the SV600, which is an acoustic imager. With that, we're able to use all of these sensors in concert or together in order to glean additional insights. Some of, just to give you an example of that, is we're currently experimenting a way to use the IR camera, the PTZ, pan tilt zoom camera and also the acoustic imager in order to see if there's a way that we can detect partial discharge. Um, obviously, these are kind of experimental things that we're doing, but these kind of opportunities may open up to us when we have such a you know, robust unit equipped with so many different sensors. So we're able to identify issues that cause that unplanned downtime or increase the energy cost. And of course, really the big thing here is the safety and security part of it. The biggest Benefit to us, you know, is getting people out of potentially life altering injuries. These are dangerous jobs and this is what these robots are here to solve. Do you uh, the, the next slide, John? Thank you, sir. And yeah, real quick, this just shows kind of the models that we have available today. Um, there's, there's more for sure, but this is just kind of a quick visual of what that does. The gauge, automated readings, and also being able to set a threshold and receiving communications based on when that threshold is passed. That same principle applies to thermal as well, except just think temperature. For acoustic, pretty similar as well, except you specify a narrow frequency band or a wide one, and we're able to help determine where that sound originated based on where it's bouncing off, right? The change detection model is in essence a collection of tools that allows 
the opportunity to experiment. Um, for Ontario Tech, we're doing this specifically with fire extinguisher detection and also um, some other like fire hose kind of equipment. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, sir. And yeah, this is just kind of a wrap up of that initial page. That top line shows that we are chassis agnostic. We can work with robots, cameras, drones, even satellite images, IoT or field devices. I've already in essence covered a lot of the platform um, models that we have. But so you know, the way that that works is we offer that set of models as kind of a way to say, we know everybody's gonna get use of this but we get to learn so much more through working directly with subject matter experts and learning more about how you guys use these tools specifically. What I mean by that is um, with thermal, for example, we learned that it isn't necessarily just the exact temperature that matters. What matters is the temperature comparison between bushings, for example. So what's the biggest difference? What's the difference between the hottest one and the coldest one? That's what matters. So those are the kind, that's the kind of information that we learn through our clients and are able to kind of build and make this platform better. All of those upgrades and updates that I'm referencing, even additional models are then folded back into our platform and provided at no additional cost. Um, just a real quick uh, end of it is that we are able to, um, in essence, the requirements to, to employ these kinds of technologies are very wide, diverse, and varied. So we have you know, the capability to work in any different way, whether that's cloud, on-premise, or any mixture thereof. Um, and you could put me in the next slide, please. Thank you, sir. All right, so kind of the quick overview, we'll breeze past this since we already kind of touched on that on the previous slides, is that the way that it works kind of beginning to end is that you use uh, whatever chassis you'd like to capture the images, whether that's CCT, cameras, or spot. Um, then the way that our product works is we take that data, visual, um, audio, or you know, thermal, what have you, and then we analyze it. So that's kind of the heart of the product that we offer is the cognitive intelligence, said differently, the ability to think on what you're seeing. So as you can see from that second picture, there's a little box drawn around that motor, that fan motor. And that's us letting, in essence, the model know what's important. What should you be looking for specifically? And then take the temperature from that. Is that too hot? Is that too cold? Does somebody need to know? Those are kind of the, the cognitive steps that we're providing for, uh, for Spot and other you know, uh, robotics to take. The alerts kind of get generated as well. And from there, the integration is kind of a larger piece and more kind of a long-term look where you have Spot out there, he's increasing the safety, it's more reliability, and it's more accurate, and we've got tons of data. And now he really knows what he's looking at. So we can take this a step further and further implement or integrate Spot into the workforce. And we do that by integrating it with enterprise asset management systems. So as I mentioned, it's safer, it's more reliable, it's more frequent, and we have tons of data, and he knows what he's looking at. Why can't he just create the work orders himself? And that's kind of where that integration piece goes. Um, but that's, of course, kind of a long-term thing once we are very sure that Spot is doing the right things, right? So uh, could you hit me with the next side, please? One more. Thank you, sir. And yeah, we're just going to breeze through uh, kind of this because I've given a pretty high level um, uh, kind of view of this. But the way that it works is we are provided the gauges that we'd like to read. The way that we do that autonomously is by receiving gauge configurations or gauge photos in order to create those configurations. So what that means is we take a head on photo, kind of like that one up there on the in the middle right there of a gauge. We then create a configuration for it, specifying the minimum, the maximum, the unit, the thresholds, all that sort of stuff. And also whether it's a logarithmic or fixed interval kind of gauge, all that sort of stuff gets uh, programmed in with this configuration. And the reason why this is created is to kind of help spot or whatever device is using it to know a little bit better what it's looking at and to interpret that information uh, more accurately. To provide an example, if for whatever reason in an 
kind of an unreasonable example is if for whatever reason your plant had 1000 of the same gauges, we would only need to create one configuration in order to read all of them. Obviously, that's not a typical use case, but that is uh, you know, kind of the way that it works there. So um, that is also tied with metadata. We know what gauge it is, what pieces of equipment it's connected to, and we're also able to correlate thermal data from attached equipment, other gauges. You know, it's through our efforts, we kind of figure out what's the densest way that we can approach this problem and get the most information and correlate as much as we can together. So that's kind of the way that we look at it here. Um, so could you do the next slide, please? One thing worth noting as well is um, the world is not built for spot, right? The, especially factories, all the gauges are eye level for people. So spot is naturally about shin height. So he needs to make those adjustments. Our visual models allow the, or automatically stretch, skew, and transform the images in order to get better re readings because we know we're not always going to be seeing them head on. And this is what those gauge configurations help us do. Right here, you'll see some real examples from um, OPG's site uh, that show some of the gauges that we configured and worked on reading. Um, these are just provided by Chris and uh, Dr. Knuckleby uh, just yesterday, I believe, uh, which is awesome to see this, you know, out in Sydney, taking readings and having success, right? So what we see in that first image is kind of a, uh, a gauge. The reading is coming out to 95 plus or minus six. You can see that on top of the bottom image. And the confidence is about 99%. We provide those kinds of numbers to let you know how confident the model is in its reading. Those numbers change depending on how difficult the read is. And unfortunately, my, my uh, image is covering that bottom right uh, gauge confidence, but I believe that one should be a little bit lower given how dark it is. Actually, yeah, you can see it says 82% right there. So yeah, these are using different types of gauges that OPG has. We're going out with Spot and doing autonomous missions, and he's providing these readings directly to the team. And, and he's just doing his job while nobody's risking their time or driving out there or anything. So could you hit me with the next slide, please? Thank you, sir. All right, here we have thermal anomaly detection. This is pretty similar to the gauge. Um, this is largely around, um, we've seen a lot of utilities in the power gen space be interested in this. Um, very similar to gauge in that we set thresholds except uh, relate them to temperature. Uh, these are also associated with a specific amount of metadata and we have the opportunity to kind of correlate or compare readings as well. Um, next slide, please. These are showing some examples. These are not from OPG's site, uh, just to be clear, but I did just want to show how this works. Uh, when I mentioned that we have the ability to compare uh, different readings, these are the types of use cases to think of. Cooling fins, insulators, um, and bushings as well. Uh, these are kind of the things that are important at these electrical substations we've learned um, in order to kind of compare. and. I'll spare you guys kind of the, the AI part of it, but we could go to the next slide here. All right, so change detection is kind of the last one that we focus on with, uh, with OPG that we have um, you know, current data to share on. Uh, so as I mentioned before, this is in essence a collection of tools. I think we're still good on time. Uh, Kevin, just let me know if I need to speed up, by the way. Um, but yeah, the change detection is just a collection of tools. Um, we provide this and the training along with it in order to provide the, the clients that we work with the ability to take our product and run with it. We're giving you a collection of tools. You guys know how to use it the most and get the most value out of it. Let's get you guys equipped to take it and run. So change detection works in a lot of different ways. Um, we've seen it for fire extinguisher detection. Um, the way it works actually is it takes a description of the scene and, and pulls out the words from it and says, there's a chair, there's a fire extinguisher, there's a hose, all that sort of stuff. And it starts comparing the items to itself. And what that kind of translates to is if, uh, if you guys remember back when newspapers were more prevalent, they would have those games in there that let that say, compare these two images, spot the difference, right? And a piece of a fence might be broken, a door may be open, or there may be a book on the table, that sort of thing. Said differently, we provide spot the expected image, 
And then we have him compare the actual and let us know the difference and if it requires somebody's attention. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? This is a little bit different of an approach where we are doing the presence or the absence of items. Uh, this is obviously for, um, for some safety items that are critical to operation of the hydroelectric substation. So the way that we kind of outfitted this is putting a QR code behind it. The reason why, and I know it, it kind of looks like, oh, this is kind of like a low tech solution. It's a little bit more scrappy kind of thing. The reality is creating these kinds of models that are able to detect specific fire extinguishers, detect this specific thing is so dependent on the scene or everything else that is kind of makes up with, makes up the photo that in order to create those kind of models, it takes thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of images in order to do that. So what this allows us to do is provide a very low cost solution in order to identify the absence or the presence of items when necessary. Some obvious use cases are, you know, PPE, fire extinguishers, fire blankets, anything needed for safety. And uh, that's kind of the, we've seen that used for 5S boards, which just to provide some context is basically some tool outlines to make sure your hammers are in the right place and that your brooms are in the right place. That largely comes into play for uh, manufacturers as well. Um, could you do the next slide, please? I think that should be it. Yeah, so good to go from my end, Kevin, on that All presentation. Right. So let's, so what I'd like to do is, um, uh, Jonathan, if you want to go back to some of the gauges, uh, actually, you know what, just let's, uh, let's kill the slides for a second. Uh, so, um, Scott and Chris, why don't we, uh, why don't we talk to, uh, uh, to you a little bit and just, just talk about as you're, as you're putting this on, um, and as you're going through the setup, what, what were your thoughts as you started to set up? What was, what were some of the, the challenges? What were you excited the most about? Uh, just give us kind of a background from your perspective as, as the ones running the project. So maybe um, just sort of a quick overview. So this is actually ongoing right now as we as we speak. Um, we launched uh, last Friday. We left spot at the Sydney Generating Station. Uh, he's been doing three, well, two different inspections, three times a day each. So um, and no issues. He's just keeps doing them so the the images you see are from some of those um actual data we've been getting uh in terms of setting up uh with the levitas that was chris he can probably go into a bit more detail but basically as um gene said we we send them images of the different gauges and they come back with the configuration files and then we just basically program when we do an auto walk we how spot works is you you take it out manually, you operate it, you tell it I want to take an image of this feature or thermal image or whatever you want, and you go through the whole auto walk and you pre-teach it, and then after that it just repeats it. And so it's just a matter of correlating those images with the uh, with the respective gauge models, and then the, run the Levitas pro, uh, platform. But maybe Chris can go a bit more details in terms of the uh, specific testing we've been doing. Yeah, and just just before we throw it to Chris, I'll, I'll add, you know, Scott, you and I talked uh, right after it went in on Friday, and we were like, you know, we've set up notifications if anything, uh, you know, spot wipes out or anything that happens, and we were kind of joking, saying we're probably going to be getting these texts on the weekend, uh, and, you know, full kudos to BD, because that is not, you know, it's an old substation, as, as Ali can tell you, it's not, it's not a walk in the park, no pun intended. Uh, yeah, it's... And a, it's it's a 110 year old facility, right? So it's a uh, it was never designed for, for autonomous dogs, and it's got some pretty steep staircase. And you can see even out, you know, it's multiple stories going down to the bottom of the generator. Um, you can see it's dark. You, you know, one of those gauges, like that's the lighting we're dealing with. We're not adding additional lighting. That's just the lighting, and it, it's still working. So it was it was interesting to see. Yeah, excellent. So it was great. So sorry, Chris. So let's go over to you, Chris. So, so you were doing the implementation. So talk to us a little bit about your thoughts. Yeah, no, I think I think the uh, pilot's going pretty well so far. Um, we've gotten once we got Levitas's platform installed on our spot in the lab, we tested out in our lab first uh, and got a handle on how everything works. And then we brought it out to the Sydney station. Uh, we essentially deployed the whole thing in uh, at less than a day. Um, it's doing two full rounds, so uh, a round around 
one auto lock around the upper rim. So it, it's checking. Um, so it's doing security checks. So it's checking for people in the facility um, and then checking the safety boards that we've seen. So is the fire extinguishers and blankets and the ladder there and all whole sorts of other stuff. And then we're testing out some some change detection conditions to see if they'll be uh, useful in the future. And then the other one is uh, sending spot all the way down into the basement, which is essentially uh, three or four stories down, some fairly steep, narrow stairs. And it's doing uh, gauge readings and some thermal readings on the way down and then coming back up. And it's had no problem so far. Hopefully it'll still keep going, but. Excellent. So Ali, let's, let's go to you. So from your, your perspective and the OPG team's perspective, what are your, you know, what are your first impressions so far? And you're, you're muted. So just unmute and let us know what your impressions are so far and what you're most excited about. Yeah, thanks for the uh, reminder, Kevin. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes when I click, when I click um, <laughs> unmute on my headset, it doesn't somehow register on um, this. So I don't know if it's a problem with my headset or the software, but whatever. Um, yeah. So I was there on, on Friday when we set up, and um, you know, as was mentioned, it took less than a day, which you know, it was pretty comprehensive uh, auto walks. So. Um, as mentioned, there it, there's a lot of flights of stairs and, and it's very dark. And it, as you can tell by the age, it's, it's a pretty old station. So um, I think us kind of testing spot in one of these kind of older sites, um, which aren't kind of revamped or they aren't, um, uh, as I, I believe Scott mentioned, uh, you know, when these were built hundreds of years ago, they weren't kind of predicting that there'd be a an automatic dog walking through it, right? So, I think it's in, I think from what I've seen so far, um, spots very agile, and um, it's getting us the information that I think will be very useful to our operators and our, um, you know, um, engineering staff. So, uh, for, from what I've seen so far, I, I do think um, you know this has a lot of potential in the future, and um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to kind of continuing to grow with it. Um, you know, just as our use case kind of develops on its own, seeing what else uh, Spot and what else Levitas can do um, to kind of kind of encapsulate really everything that we'd want from a maintainer to do to have it be done um, through a robotic dog. So, um, so far, so good, I'll say. Great. So just, just on that sort of theme, so have you got any, like what, once we get through this pilot thing, what are the things that now that you've started it, what are the first things you think, oh, we would we would love to be able to have the project expand to this? Is there is there anything that comes right to mind for the next stuff? Yeah, well, I think first assessing kind of, uh, you know, the reliability of the, the data that we've been getting. Um, you know, I think there'll be quite a, quite a focus on that because, you know, if we eventually want to just be fully autonomous with this type of stuff, maybe not fully, but heavily reliant um, on it. Uh, you know, we kind of have to have that backing that, um, you know, the data is, um, the integrity of the data is there. So, you know, I think with these uh, monthly inspections that I mentioned uh, before, you know, if we can, and after checkbox, uh, right? So, um, you know, if we can kind of set up an auto walk to fulfill, you know, every single step of that in the order, um, and try to test that out. I think that would be useful. Um, and just seeing, you know, what can it do, what can't it do, um, to kind of just get a better sense of, from the the maintenance part of things, uh, how how can uh, Spot um, serve useful? And and I think I did mention in my in my spiel there that you know preventative maintenance I think is also a big thing. So even um, aside from these monthly inspections, you know, just having the dog walk around on a regular basis. Uh, you know, just checking things out, seeing if there's leaks in areas where, you know, there might be, it might be, they might be prone to leaks. Um, you know, just ensuring that, you know, the people detection things is an important thing. I and mean, trust, don't want to deal with trespassers and stuff like that. So um, I think there are a lot of applications we can use for this, but uh, those are some of the the ones that I think will kind of take us to the to the next step. Excellent. Excellent. Scott, I know you got to jump in a second. So let, let me ask you a question from your, uh, 
you know, with your professor hat on and lab hat on, what are, what are the things that you really want to try next, whether it's at OPG or on another project? What are you most excited about? I think just sort of pushing the capabilities of, um, you know, making this more economical to deploy, right, in terms of, um, uh, the you know, the AI and the image processing and so on. Because, yeah, you can you can put AI on any problem. But as Gene was saying, if you need a thousand images to, to, t- uh, to get that scenario working, it's, it's not cost effective, right? So I think, you know, Levitas has some nice uh, tools and then just seeing how far we can go with stuff like that to just make it economical to actually deploy, right? Because that, you know, I see there's a, a message in the chat. Um, at this point, we're not looking at return on investment per se. We're just looking at, is it feasible at this point? And I would leave that more to OPG about the costs and so on. Uh, they aren't cheap, but, you know, equipping a whole... Uh, facility with sensors that can then is not cheap as well right and then when you're talking about 66 dams you know it can, it can cost that up there so i think it's looking at can this become a feasible and affordable enough to deploy that's sort of what i'm looking forward to to exploring yeah. excellent chris what about you you're the one that actually has to do all the work here so yeah no i i'm I'm looking forward to getting the data back from this deployment and seeing, you know, what, what stuff works really well, what stuff needs improvement and, and, you know, how, how can we get this to a full stage where we can deploy these all on their own? Like Ali was talking about. Yeah. Perfect. And I think, I think the important thing is Scott, you kind of hit it on the, on the head. Uh, OPG has 66 generating dams. I think, I think hydro Quebec, I can't remember the number. I think it's significantly more than that. Um, a lot of these things are, are in really, really remote areas. So it's one thing where we can go, you know, and deal with spot if, if, if it falls down. But the real payoff is going to be in some of these remote sites. And what we're seeing early on is that, A, we have the reliability to, you know, operate spot remotely. And B, we, we have um, very promising results with, with the AI part of this in terms of being able for notifications and being able to see some of the things we want. So... To me, that's the most exciting part of this is is being able to expand it into the remote areas. So um, and I think I, also just sorry to jump in, Kevin, just the, the ability to do more frequent inspections, right? That yeah. open, and not just inspections, but, you know, it's simultaneously security, right? Like you, you can combine the two. We've already done 20 something auto walks this week um, where, you know, they might go once a month to visit this dam, right? Like yeah. you're already seeing, a, you know, the frequency you can do such a, a lot more analysis of what's going on right with that much data right and and, and i think that that's a, a it's a great point scott and one of the things that we talked about in one of the earlier sessions for you know as a new kind of a new job is a, is a lot of our service providers whether they're uavs or on the ground anybody collecting a lot of imagery data i mean there's probably a whole business there of just collecting imagery for training ai right and these are people that already know the images that inspectors need. They're already, in some cases, they already have existing contracts. So like you, like you said, you, you just hit it on the head, right? You, you've got 20 times. And by the time the month is over, when they would have one inspection, you're, you're probably going to have hundreds, right? And so even for people that are trying to build these models, just doing that will, will be a quantum improvement. So, um, so I'm glad you brought that up, Scott. It's, it's, it's a fantastic point. Um, so just before we wrap up, um, Gene, I would like to ask you for, for the question there. It is a significant investment. Obviously, you have some, some partners in the U.S. Uh, you've been doing this a while. What, what, what are the early returns on investment? Like, what are you actually seeing, you know, quantitatively in those, uh, in those areas right now so far? What are, what are the early returns telling us? Yeah, good question. So um, usually we see these kinds of returns once Spot has the ability to run these kind of uh, regularly, kind of like in a pilot where he has the opportunity to prevent an outage, right? So then you kind of look at the opportunity cost of what that outage costs you and kind of take it from there. Um, More kind of relative to the clients that we've worked with on some hard numbers, uh, we've worked with a semi-chip conductor manufacturer um, where we equipped Spot with the acoustic imager that I mentioned, this being kind of a new piece of equipment that we're able to use in concert with the other payloads, allowed us to identify a fan that was breaking before it broke into an engine and cost, I think, 20000 additional dollars of damage, whereas the fan identifying that it was about to break cost $10. So 
we identified, I believe, two on our first site visit um, with Spot. And that, to Scott and your point, is we're not just doing these checks twice a year, guys. You know, we're doing them multiple, multiple times, and we're able to prevent these outages more and more as time goes on, especially when Spot is kind of present and performing these routes regularly. So we've seen some pretty big gains and pretty early on, to be honest, because this kind of technology is exciting. The big thing is that it gets everybody else in the industry in your company thinking about how they can use it as well. The applications are far beyond typically the first place that we look. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, uh, speakers. If you just want to stick on around with me for like one minute, thank you, uh, everybody, for uh, for joining us. Uh, our final wrap up session will be tomorrow at eleven a.m. Eastern time, and uh, and that'll be exciting. And actually, actually, I believe Scott, you're going to come and join us for a part of that. We will be uh, we will be talking uh, some of the upcoming innovations from the RMUS Autonomy Lab. Uh, some of the manufacturers that we've talked to, the OEMs on the week, and you'll get a chance to uh, to see some of the some of the things that are percolating in there. So for OPG, for Levitas, and of course uh, our favorite university in Ontario, Ontario Tech. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, have a good rest of your day.